Good evening. I'm Frank Stacio, host of the State of Things on North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to our last Duke Reads of this academic year. Tonight, Steve Nowicki, Dean and Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education at Duke, is joining us. He's also Bass Fellow and Professor in the Departments of Biology, Psychology, and Neuroscience at Trinity College and in the Neurobiology Department in the Duke School of Medicine. He holds a BS and MS degrees from Tufts University, a PhD from Cornell, joined the Duke faculty in 1989, and was appointed Dean and Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education in 2007. He's the author of a number of technical articles about neurobiology and behavior, co-author of The Evolution of Animal Communication. His research has been supported by the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, among other organizations. In 1999, he was awarded the John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship, also received the Robert B. Cox Trinity College Distinguished Teaching Award. And in the mid-1990s, he comprehensively revised the introductory biology program at Duke, including the development of a new teacher training program for graduate students who serve as mentors to student, uh, student learning teams. He's the author of a high school textbook, Biology. What's that about? Biology. <laughs> he also <laughs> plays the trombone, the tuba, the Duke, in the Duke University pep band, balancing his, uh, his professional time between research, teaching, administration, and basketball games, and somehow found the time to read Bel Canto, <laughs> which is his choice tonight. Uh, Bel Canto, of course, by Ann Patchett. And Steve indicates that it caught my attention immediately because I'd spent a summer working in the Peruvian Andes in the late 70s, just as the Shining Path and Tupac Amaru revolutionary movement was taking hold. So we should start the discussion. You were up, that's a, that was a pretty dangerous time to be there. Well, I didn't know it at the time. And, it, and I don't think anybody knew it at the time. Um, I was a graduate student and interested in doing field biology in the Andes, in a part of the Andes. It's called the Altiplano, the High Plateau. And so I went up there with backpack and uh, binoculars and notebooks and spent a, a remarkable several months uh, living with um, the people up there and traveling around. And it was only when I got back down mm. to Lima that um, I realized that things were pretty tense. Mm. You know, I had gotten into Lima, I got right up into the mountains, I came down, it took me a while to get a flight out. And there were soldiers on every street corner, and it was a tense time in Peru then. And then when I flew back, I heard that there was, a, I mean, I think it's a fairly um, famous incident of the execution of a, a couple of French photographers, mm -hmm. uh, only a few kilometers from where I was working. So I consider that a lucky escape. And, and uh, you know, that was it. I've never been to Peru since, but it was something that caught my eye when I, you know, read the dust jacket here. I said, I you know, sort of have the sense of familiarity because there was a famous incident, the Lima incident, m many years later uh, when there was a, a hostage situation that lasted for quite a long time um, that eventually ended in, in a lot of bloodshed. Yeah. Well, the theme, Art Imitates Life, Life Imitates Art, is certainly central to this book and your first question. Uh, from the very first sentence, opera is used as a framework that connects the characters in the book. Could anything else, the visual arts, science, and politics, have served as equally effective a framework? Why or why not? What do you think? Well, you know, I can't think of anything else that could have worked. I, I mean, maybe not opera, but, but certainly music. I mean, and certainly music because it, it is, um, you know, something that provides a narrative that that charms people. And you know, early on, these young terrorists are, are, are deeply charmed by Roxanne's voice. Uh, and in fact, I remember there's an expression early on where um, you know, it's thought uh, in the villages where they come that a girl could sing had caught a bird in her mouth, right? That was the way they thought about it. Um, and opera in particular, because opera has a storyline associated with it. Um, and I think that there's, there's an interesting um, parallel here with the the high opera that is the music that brought brings everybody together and starts the mixing and the confusion of relationships and you know the the other opera the opera on tv you know maria and the soap opera that also is drawing in the, you know many of the terrorists as well and there's sort of a parallel set of stories about uh, the difficult times 
And again, it's it's sort of life imitating art and vice versa throughout. Yeah, and opera, as you say, it's not only it's it's lyrical, it's emotional too. I mean, it really is about how you feel with a narrative line and a structure. Mm -hmm. And it made me really wish I knew more about opera because I, I bet if I did, the structure of this novel would would be yet another level of enjoyment. Well, me too. I mean, I I have to say, I I, I actually was trained in classical music when I went to college first, so I, I feel like I'm comfortable with that genre, but I, I actually don't know opera deeply. And, you, you know, one wonders if you knew the operas that they're referencing, if you wouldn't see some of the themes or actually the whole plot line right. play out um, through some of those operas. And I wonder, I, I'm just speculating on the assumptions that Ann Patchett is making, but I think of opera as, as mostly... Uh, sung in other people's languages. So the idea of being moved, you can listen to Italian and exactly. German opera and be moved and not always know what they're saying. Exactly. Let's and, you know, the, the, the central relationship that develops between uh, Roxanne and Mr. Hosokawa, you know, the, a deep relationship that, that eventually leads to deep passion, that they could never talk to each other. Right. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. They communicated, and of course they communicated through Jen, and we'll get to some of that. Joanne had a response to, to your first question. She said, I think that opera was the most effective framework to connect the characters. People from all countries who spoke different languages were all united through the beauty of Roxanne's singing. Her singing was the connecting force in the novel, and opera crossed all language barriers. Terrorists and guests were mesmerized and were later connected through the medium, I don't think there was any other option or that would have been as effective, uh, and anything else probably would not have worked. Well, I'd have to agree with Joanne. I can't imagine myself what would work. Although, through it all, and we can't forget that that it's true that everyone in the room, uh, both the terrorists and the hostages, were mesmerized and enthralled with her singing. The fact is that Jen did play a key role in the translation. So language itself, and I, and I think ultimately the, the relationship that he had with her and frankly his boss's relationship, it was a kind of speak for yourself, John, yeah. Um, um, yeah. situation. So we can't forget the, the value of language in all this. Well, the, 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 the relationship that develops between Jen and Carmen, you'll recall, right. you know, she first comes to him and... I mean, and in a very, you know, sensual scene, you know, lies down next to him and her, her eyelashes are brushing against him. But she says she wants to be taught language. She wants to learn how to actually read Spanish and, she, and maybe even learn English. And so, you know, she's captured by the music, but what she really wants is, is the language. And that draws her to Jen. And, and that's something, I mean, it's interesting because he's giving, uh, I mean, he's vital to everybody. He's important to everybody. There's no question about that. But there's something, to me, different about her request in that she was asking for a gift, the thing that he knows how to do, not just, not just to act as a, an intermediary, right. but show me this thing that you do and how right. you do that thing. Yeah, and that... Exactly. that that gets to some other themes in the book that we'll talk about. There are but a lot of gifts that are asked through this. Um, the uh, the terrorist, um, the little boy um, uh, Ishmael, you know, mm -hmm. wants to learn chess. And of course, at the very end, the the young terrorist um, uh, Caesar, you know, just bursts forth with song. And you know, earlier in the book, you know, he's like everybody else, just enthralled. And, I mean, you'll recall that, he, you know, he actually has an erection, but he, mm. he understands that it's the music right. that's doing it for him, and he, you know, wants to... Although, interestingly, that was a big turning point because he was afraid to or unwilling to or unable to ask Roxanne to teach him. You know, he goes and runs right. and hides in a tree, and, and in many ways that's sort of the beginning of a transformation of the whole... Uh, set of relationships, you know, before and after that incident where um, uh, Caesar runs off, mm -hmm. you know, everything changes. Yeah, it's interesting, too, to think about that when you talked about gifts back and forth, and I think one of the things I took from this book is a deeper understanding of what what love really is, about being able to give a sacrificial kind of giving and, and a sacrificial receiving, accepting in that deep way. Yeah, and you know that you know that asking's a problem when we can see characters who have a deep 
yearning and don't know how to yeah. don't know don't know how to ask. The guy's got a gun. <laughs> He's got a gun. He's taken the place by force. That I can do, but I don't know how to ask you yeah. for something that is yeah. essentially yours, and you have to you have to be willing to give me. Right. Yeah. He couldn't point the gun and demand it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a, the the. Um, I think that a, a reference point for the love relationships throughout is the relationship between Simon and Edith. Everybody, I mean, almost everybody, literally, falls in love with Roxanne, right. but never Simon. I mean, he's always thinking about his wife who, you know, leaves in the first wave of releases, and he's always coming back, just wishing he could be with her, you know, in many ways professing his really deep love, his not a superficial love throughout. And I think that provides us with a reference mm -hmm. of of a love relationship that we can keep coming back to throughout as these other relationships are developing and forming in very complex and some, sometimes very unexpected ways. And you know, it's interesting you say that because they did change and they changed a lot and having that reference point mm -hmm. allowed you, as you just said, allowed you to see how things had changed. And yet throughout the book, the, the, the hostages are all talking about and, if, and everybody in that house about how slow it's all going. And they're giving the impression that over these four months, you know, how could this thing drag on so long? Yeah. So you have these, I think, then this is the craft of the writer, these wonderful dynamics where there's a kind of a, yes, yeah, slow motion drawn out, how many more trays of food can we possibly, you know? And yet the dynamics are spinning at superhuman speed. People don't fall in love and out of love that fast, <laughs> especially with guns in the room. Um, I, I think it shows great craftsmanship. Yeah, the, the narrative is actually, in, in some ways, very slow. Not much happens, I mean, in terms of action. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just a few events, really, that are pivotal. But 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 I found it a page turn, you Absolutely. know, as much as any action <laughs> novel could be. Absolutely, and that, that just dazzled me, because I, I yeah. looked at the same thing. I thought, you know, there's nothing happening here, and I can't put the book down. We are happy for any of your comments today, talking with Steve Nowicki about... The His Choice on Duke Reed's Bel Canto by Ann Patchett. The question we're working on is, is, is Opera the Best Framework, but we'll entertain any of your questions or observations as we continue. Why don't we move on to the second question, which is that all of the relationships that develop in the book end abruptly and violently, the closest ones, as the narrative concludes. Is there a broader statement being made here, or is this conclusion just an inevitable consequence of the circumstances that brought the characters together? I, I have to say that um, I knew, <laughs> as I was, you know, getting to the end of the book, you know, I mean, and you're told right up front. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the author tells you right up front that all of the terrorists are going to die. I mean, that, that, you know, in an ironic sense. So you know this is going to happen. And it's just getting closer and closer to the end of the book, and you're wondering what's going to happen. I mean, it built a, an interesting kind of, um, you know, Hitchcock tension for me. And then... You know, for me, all of a sudden, again, Roxanne is singing with, um, with Caesar, and she screams, and you've had, you know, almost 300 pages of narrative, and it's over in three pages. And it's very, very terse. You know, there's not a lot of deep description. Um, in was, um, Carmen's death was not described in the same way as any of the other deaths. Um, you'll remember the, um, the, uh, uh, the other girl, whose name I'm forgetting, the other girl terrorist. Um, yeah, um, uh, me too. <laughs> anyway, you know, they describe her death in some detail, or, or Ann Patchett describes her right. death, you know, right. because she's trying to surrender, and she's going to hold her arms up as high as possible, yeah. and she's going to do what she's told, and you, you can just see the scene, and then, then it describes how she's hit with a bullet, and I remember it, it's quite, mm -hmm. you know, poetic in a grim way, you know, she feels the, a pain rising in her chest, and it's, I forget the exact word, but she's, she's pushed out of life. But with Carmen, what you hear instead is Jen saying she, of course, is going to get away. She's the cleverest one. And, you know, Jen starts screaming, she's my wife, she's my wife. He doesn't know where she is. And then the narrative just turns and says, but, of course, you know, it was too late because she was one of the first ones to die. And then after the fact, 
describes both her death and Mr. Hosokawa's death. You know, the two right. others of those two love relationships with one bullet, you know. And interestingly, again, in a twist, it's the, it's the, um, uh, uh, the terrorist who's being shot at, and it's the captive who is getting in the way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one bullet pierces them both, and then they're lying there in, in what Ann Patchett describes as the least expected couple, mm -hmm. right? And they were the least expected couple, but now both dead. And so it's just such a sudden ending, and then an epilogue. And a beautiful turn of the phrase, because, again, as I, as I began to anticipate how this was all going to end and thought about some of the deeper themes, and, and love was certainly one of the big ones that had emerged by then, then love, then the willingness to love, in, in the certainty of death, one of us is going to leave this relationship. N neither of us gets out alive. That's a remark, it made me see how remarkable that is, yeah. to agree, to be in love, to develop a relationship when I know one of us is going to have to endure the death of the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, for, so, so for them to be both an unlikely couple and yet the inevitability of their yeah. death in the same sentence uh, yeah. was both, uh, I thought, a, a work of craftsmanship, but it sort of brings you to that moment of right. Very reflection. Touching. Very um, touching. Beautiful book, beautifully written. Um, and the violin, and did it, you know, there are questions about whether, even with the warnings we had all the way, uh, that it was almost too violent. It was it was a hard book to read, that there are maybe folks who, who might be uncomfortable with this what? or shouldn't read it. Well, uh, you know, I don't think it was graphically too violent, but but psychologically yeah. quite difficult. Um, but I asked myself, um, and this might be jumping ahead to another question, but, um, you know, these are terrorists. Yeah. They come in and um, with guns, and they take a whole bunch of hostages, and, you know, that they're bad people. I mean, yeah. they're bad people... Yeah because they're terrorists, right? And in this modern day, how could we have sympathy for a terrorist? But, um, you know, somehow you lose that sense. You know, you, you gain a sense of even, even the hardest of the two generals, you know, I think it was Hector, you know, mm. finally he relents, he lets people go out. And, and it's that um, kind of softening that I think is what, you know, um, is, is counter to the violent end. In other words, if we, if we didn't know these people, right. if we were just right. reading the newspaper, if we were in Durham, North Carolina, and we had been following something like this through the newspapers, and, and we learned that all of the terrorists were killed and only one hostage was killed, we'd say, what a success. Exactly. What a success. But having gotten to know these people and seeing how, how the captors become the captives in some way, or there's a reciprocation of that relationship, all of a sudden, it becomes a much more difficult thing. I mean, reading the newspaper story of this, right. we might think no problem. But, you know, getting into the lives, as Ann Patchett has allowed us to do with her fictional right. um, version of this, um, it all of a sudden becomes very troubling. It becomes emotionally powerful. But think about the, the, uh, the movie version of this as simply, as simply an adventure film where mm. all we wanted to do, we didn't, we we're going to take all the artistry out of this and just make it an action thriller. So all we cared about was the bloodshed. You can imagine how shocking all of that would be. One of the things that, in effect, softens it for me, at the same time it makes it more deeply felt, is precisely because they had relationships. So at least they had that. So something was born out of this right. mayhem and bloodshed. Right. Something was born, and you're left with that, or I was anyway, that, that feeling that, well, if this is what it took, you know, yeah. then, then it, at least there was that. At least these right. relationships emerged. Right. The captives remember, and, you know, there's something of the now dead captors that you imagine will survive in mm -hmm. the minds and mm -hmm. imaginations of, of those who were captive. In fact, near the end, I, I recall one of the things that upsets Jen in the very final chapter, you know, after he marries Roxanne, mm -hmm. is the fact that the newspapers didn't mention the two girls. Right. And that somehow seems wrong to him. Right. Um, why don't we move on to the third question? And uh, again, if you have any questions or comments or observations about Bel Canto, 
uh, we'd love to hear from you, especially the writing. I, I just found, again, the, the writing was both powerful and simple and mm -hmm. funny. I mean, there were these, these quick turns of phrases that were clever, ironic, um, never overwrought, and yet powerfully done. I was just uh, so impressed with the craftsmanship. Bel Canto uh, presents a strong visual sense of place. One can almost walk through the house in one's mind after finishing the book. Um, how does the author make this happen, and how does this strong sense of place support the narrative? Well, uh, you know, I wonder if everybody who reads this would have the same visual sense that I had. I'm, I'm not convinced. It would be interesting to know what other readers think right. about that. Um, I could picture the living room. I could picture the back stairs. I could picture the kitchen. But, but mostly I could picture sort of the, the uh, overall atmosphere. I mean, one of the things that, that re I remember that just keeps coming back to is the, this, um, this uh, persistent, deep, misty fog that's so characteristic of the Peruvian coast, the Garua. And they, you know, they refer to the Garua, it's just obscuring the outside, and so everything is in the inside. And you, you know there are walls outside, but you don't get to go outside, and so it's all reflected inside. And then for me, when you know that lifts, you know I think it sort of starts lifting in, in sort of the late fall in that part of the world, and mm -hmm. you're getting into winter. So you know after the first few weeks, that lifts, and they can start seeing out, and they know there's an outside world. And then, of course, when they're allowed to go outside, all of, it, all of a sudden now you, you, you read about the gardens and you see the wall and you get a better sense of the place. Um, to me, that was, that was really compelling uh, imagery that came out of, as you say, the elegant uh, and simple turn of phrase. It was, the other thing it did was because it stimulated the, your, the visual so much, I mean, because you had these sharp, clear pictures, and again, the cleverness of an emerging clarity of the outside world as, as the seasons progressed, it, it also brought into relief how much you couldn't see. You really wanted to see the faces. I mean, Mesner is going back and forth as the negotiator, True. but who's on the other side yeah. of that? Who are those people? You know, what do uh, they look like? Where are they living? Right. You know, and, 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 and who, who was it that was really controlling the outside? Right. And, you know, right. Mesner, um, I mean, one of the few people, well, actually, I think even he, early on, did have a little bit of a love statement about Roxanne, but really trying to, to stay very neutral. Um, uh, and on the other side, somebody was making plans, digging tunnels. I mean, I never figured out what happened, to tell you the truth. Did they mm -hmm. dig a tunnel and yeah. come up through the floor? Did they just come through the other side because they knew that everybody was playing soccer on one mm -hmm. side of the house or something? But... But whoever was making those decisions, um, you never got to know. And then, of course, the, the president, the, who was supposed to be right. the hostage, <laughs> right. you only got to know just a little bit in the superficial and, yeah. and, and um, you know, somewhat comic sense early on. And the only reason he missed this was because of an opera, <laughs> it, a soap a opera. A particular kind of opera, right? But, but an opera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, uh, and and the, the role of the mediators, too. Jen, on the one hand, uh, who's the language broker and communicating messages, and then Mesner. But in, in, the case, in Jen's case, we know who he's talking with, and we can see some of the outcomes. We can gauge reactions and how it's all going. So fascinating with Mesner, where, where you know, communication goes in, it goes you know, into that outside world, and you can't quite tell what's happening. I mean, is he a spy? Is he an informant? Is he the reason they were able to? He's always taking down information. Right. Was he? We don't know. Um, so th th it seems to me two different kinds of mediation. There's somebody whose job is media. You know, you're always trying to think, what's yeah. the role of the translator in this? Uh, two very different roles or that we got a glimpse of. And, and you know, at the very end, Mesner, um, you know, he becomes very agitated. I mean, the last meeting or two, you know, he's clearly upset yeah. because he clearly knows yeah. that this is about to happen and, you know, wants the generals to give up, tries to convince Jen to give, you know, to convince them to, or tells Jen to convince them to right. give up. And, and you know, I mean, that's when you knew that the, yeah. the shoe was going to drop, when Mesner clearly mm -hmm. is upset. And then I think at some point, you know, he just comes in very perfunctorily and leaves and, and then, you know, it hits... And it hits. 
Um, on this question, Joanne says the entire novel takes place inside the house or walls surrounding the residence. One hears the noises from the town and on the other side of the wall, but the description of the setting outside the walls is non-existent. Uh, through Patchett's description of rooms, closets, stairways, and garden, and the manner in which various characters, often in secrecy or at night, make their way through the house or the yard, one feels as if one's present in the novel setting. The stable setting enables the characters to form relationships. The story develops in a confined space, and I have never read a book, she says, which has so greatly transported me into the setting. So, Joanne's with you 100%. Well, well said. I mean, that's, that's really yeah. well said. And actually, that's a very interesting point, that by having such a, a strong sense of place, it provides a set, a stable set, where these relationships will develop. And, you know, I mean... Um, uh, the bedroom that Roxanne, as the only woman captive, is allowed to sleep in, is guarded on the outside by Carmen. Um, and, you know, then you find out that there's a back way to get to this. And, you know, it, it's fascinating. I agree. And, and it's that stable set that allows the characters to not only move around in interesting ways physically, but, but uh, in terms of their relationships and emotionally. And again, if you imagine an opera stage, that's exactly what happens. That's true. That, Good that point. you're given, you know, that that's all the space they have. Right. And everything that, you know, transpires has to happen right. there. And the sounds offset or just the noise of the war or the city or whatever. Yes, exactly. And and yeah, and there is that mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. world over and against their, mm -hmm. you know, sort of what keeps them going. Uh, now Joanne does say she was spellbound and I wanted a happy ending. Uh -huh. <laughs> and in a way, I suppose, uh -huh. I mean, the very ending is... Not well, I wanted happy. a happy ending, too. I always want a happy yeah. ending. But I, as I said, I, I think that uh, Ann Patchett makes it pretty clear at the beginning yeah. that this is not going to be a happy ending. Well, you want them all to survive. But if you do take that other theme, that deeper theme, that, that we're all, you know, sort of none of us gets out of this alive, what do we do in the meantime? Um, th th there is something that comes out of it, so you can take that away. But, yeah, when you get to know these people and they get to be your friends. And... Look, she gives us, I mean, some reason to sympathize with them going in. I mean, they're not being, you, you may not agree with their tactic, and I wouldn't, but they've been through some rough times. They've been treated very badly, and they've lost people, too. And, right. and they're pretty powerless, and this is about the only way they can figure right. to do this. So right. we're not, it's not as though they're doing it for the money. Well, and, and when I was in Peru many years ago, uh, living up in the Alto Plano, the poverty yeah. was, was, Outstanding. I mean, I had I, it, at at that. I mean, I was twenty two years old, but I had never, you know, seen such poverty. And it wasn't just up in the mountains. It was down near the city. You know, the uh, the, uh, the the slum that was outside of Lima that I you know that you would drive through from the airport. And I had never seen you know uh, thousands upon thousands of people in in shelters that were made of maybe you know. Um, cardboard and you know scraps yeah. i mean it was it was it was a real eye opener for me and so of course and 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 you know i mean depending on where you are in in how you think about any of these things you know sometimes such people are called freedom fighters mm -hmm. and sometimes they're called terrorists and um i mean i don't i i don't know enough about peruvian politics to and of course this is not necessarily set in peru this right. is a fictional novel but but it is an interesting problem. And she gives you some of those details. So what, what we know as readers is that they came from a very uncomfortable situation that would seem to us, to any reasonable human being, an unjust situation. Yeah. You and I wouldn't take up arms that way to solve it, but right. at least we could identify with the source of their grief and the source of their outrage. And we, we began to see that a lot of the politics falls away. I mean, the, the, the president is a buffoon. We, we have no respect for him. He's nominally the most important character in the book. Um, the, the, and the people in the House develop relationships that seem to transcend their politics. It becomes utterly unimportant well, what you, you believe know, in it. The, the vice president, you know, Vice yeah. President Iglesias, yeah. is a very interesting character because... As this unfolds, he goes back to his working class origins, mm -hmm. and he's scrubbing the floors inside. And when they're allowed outside, he's working the gardens. And, and you know, he comes from that, maybe not from where the terrorists are coming from, but from closer to that, 
than what we presume the right. buffoonerous president is coming from. <laughs> there, you know, I wonder about the happy ending issue, though. So, mm-hmm. Patchett gives us an epilogue. You know, if you if you stopped at before the epilogue, then it would just be mm. completely unhappy. Yeah. But there's one happy thing I found right. in the epilogue, and that is that Simon survives. Right, as, as I said before, yeah. I found the the relationship mm-hmm. between Simon and Edith Tybalt to be right. kind of a, a reference point throughout because he, the very beginning, he expressed his deep love and a very mature love. You know, it wasn't; right. it was a very deep love, right. and he just kept through that with, with that throughout. And you know, there was a a time when I could see <laughs> the hammer coming, right. where I wonder, all right, so is it going to be really bad? You know, is is Simon going to get killed and not be able to go back to Edith and? He survives, and in fact, that's the only couple, as a point of reference, I think, that is at the wedding that happens at the very end in the epilogue. Um, I think more interesting to me is, uh, at, well, at, uh, another interesting question about happy endings is the marriage between right. Jen and Roxanne. Is that a happy ending? Or is that just an inevitable ending? Is that two people who are traumatized, who have... Nothing else they could possibly do. There's nobody else in the world that they could possibly relate to. Uh, and interestingly, um, you know, in, to me, the relationship with Roxanne and Mr. Hosokawa, Jen's employer, for whom he was the translator, was completely nonlingual. It was all emotional, mm-hmm. all about the music. There was no language there. They didn't speak the same language. Um, the relationship between Jen and... And, and Carmen, as we were saying before, was deeply about language mm-hmm. because Carmen wanted to learn language. And so that's why she first came to Jen. And so now Mr. Hosokawa and, Jen, and, and Carmen are both killed. So does Jen really deeply appreciate that music mm. the way Mr. Hosokawa did? And in fact, did, does Roxanne deeply appreciate the language? You know, they're, they're living in Italy. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a convenient place for her. But Jen was doing the translating with her, between Hosokawa mm-hmm. and Roxanne when, when words did pass between them. And so one wonders if the passion that didn't pass, well, that seemingly yeah. passed from Hosokawa was in fact coming from Jen. And the other question is, is there something else about me that's lovable other than this great gift of mine, right. which, is, which is music that he may have recognized all the time and had been expressing in the guise of a translator, but in fact it was his own passion. Well, that is true, and and I think early on there's a, a, a when when this is first when when Mr. Hosokawa is first relating to Roxanne, there's a, a passage in there talking about this connection between Mr. Hosokawa and Jen as being a, I forget exactly how it's described, but you know sort of um, you know two halves that have right. to be together. You know you know Jen is able to use his words but doesn't know what to say. Mm-hmm. Mr. Hosokawa knows what he wants to say but doesn't have the words, and neither of them could do it without the other. And there's that aspect. And also, I always found it suspicious that he that his relationship and love for Roxanne was no different before he met her than, than after, yeah. in a way. I mean, so he was always in love with some figure in his mind. Just who, the music. Who, just the music. Yeah. I mean, clearly she had a physical presence in the, in that sound, but it, it it always made me suspicious of their relationship. I thought, yeah. he doesn't has he ever really gotten to know her or gotten past his yeah. impression of her? Yeah, he has a lot of self doubt that comes out once he really becomes involved when he goes and reflects back on his life before mm-hmm. and his wife and his family, wondering did that have any meaning? So perhaps he's figuring out this meaning. Now, but what about Jen and, and um, Carmen? I mean, was that deep? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, uh, it, it was certainly young and passionate. Right. Um, so, but, you know, young passion doesn't necessarily equate to deep love, says those of us who have moved beyond <laughs> in decades. Um, and so, you yeah. know, maybe, yeah. maybe their young passion was also superficial. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So th- those are all the questions that, that get raised in this mm. exquisite novel, but handled deeply, you yeah. know, not superficially at all. Let's move on to question four. And again, if you have any uh, observations or comments you want to make along the way, please do. Bel Canto was written before 9-11. Uh, in it, the terrorists are portrayed as idealist, almost noble, if inept. Does the rise of global terrorism following the book's publication affect the way we might interpret it? Did it for you? 
Not for me. Um, and that's because I was just thinking about, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the South American scene, which is not very different from the global terrorism we think about now. Um, and, and actually, it wasn't, if I remember, this was actually published right after 9-11, but was written before. Oh, I so, I mean, I think it must have been in publication right. right when that happened. You know, maybe a better question would have been, how would have Ann, in, and maybe we should ask her, how would mm -hmm. Ann Patchett have written this differently if she had written the bulk of it after 9-11 when, um, you know, this nation, you know, Americans, uh, well, you know, what the Western world had suffered such right. horrific, horrific, um, you know, outrage from terrorist activities such as had never been, right. you know, imagined before. Would right. one have even been prompted to write a book where the you know where where sympathy could develop for terrorists I, I, that's a question for ann patchett it is although what she does is create a situation where the terrorists are intimate with their hostages and and it was one of the horrors of 9 11 was precisely its its anonymity yeah i mean i mean i mean we you don't get to know anybody yeah you, you, and so we all lose that ability to do precisely what we think makes peace, which is to get to know your enemy. Well, that's true. And, you know, even beyond 9-11, the, the image of the suicide bomber mm -hmm. as a terrorist right. attack, that's different from the hijacking or the yeah. hostage taking. You know, then you have a period of the potential for some relationship developing, but, but a suicide bomber right. has an idea and goes in, and the relationship between that person and their victims is zero. And that raises a good question. I mean, I mean, are there fundamentally two types of terrorism? Is one, uh, one group so rooted in the hope of some kind of transformation that, that the longer you stay alive and the longer you get, in other words, hostage taking becomes the preferred means of terrorism. Mm. You wouldn't consider a suicide bombing, even though you may be taking your life in your own hands, mm. uh, because our only hope is in relationship even if you're angry, even if you have a power relationship that's asymmetrical. Right. Well, you know, that brings to mind a book I read many years ago, and I'd have to recall it, but uh, Doris Lessing's The Good Terrorist, which is something that was certainly written before 9-11, yeah. but yeah. is a, you know, a, a, a description of, of, a very detailed description of the life of this young woman as she gets involved in, again, a, a fairly um, complex, sometimes inept terrorists. Um, organization. Uh, and and I remember when I was reading that book saying, this person is just a little confused, making some bad choices, right, some of which right. are really bad and have some negative consequences, but it's not an ideologue. It's not somebody who is so deeply angry that they couldn't be brought back. It's just a person who's confused going down a path right. without any guidance back. Well, and it shows you the power of language. Once we call you a terrorist, you lose your civil rights, you lose your human rights, you lose, you lose your humanity. <laughs> you lose your humanity. Yeah. Um, and, and if we don't wait until you, know, you, sort of, you commit the act or we demonstrate that, it's a little difficult then to, to make a, a cool judgment. So language played an important part. Who's doing the interpreting? Who's calling the names and who's having to endure the name calling? All of that makes a difference in how the relationship evolves. Right, and in this book, um, in Bel Canto, um, there is only one death that is sort of caused by the terrorists, and that's right. the first accompanist, who, if right. you recall... Yeah, the diabetic. He's diabetic, he goes into a coma, but it's entirely his own foolish right. decision, and, and one that's motivated by his love for right. Roxanne. Right. So it's deep passion, again, that, that clouds yeah. judgment, and then what do we call you? Right. Um, Joanne wanted to talk about this question as well, uh, the question of how we would receive this book or how it might have been written. The rise of global terrorism might affect how some people interpret this novel. However, I read the book and was so captivated by the characters, came to like the terrorists and wanted them to survive and hoped that they, there would be a way for everyone to be saved. I felt like some of the characters who hoped that they had... Uh, never have to leave the house or who had plans for the terrorist to become like a son and get married, et right. cetera, right? 
uh, Iglesias, the um, is that the name of the boy, the uh, the boy who wanted to play chess. Uh, that was um, um, I'm forgetting his name. But the vice president wanted to adopt right, him. I right. mean, uh, when Ishmael. It, Ishmael. That was Ishmael. When in reality, it it was not possible. Um, however, one was hopefully idealistic about the outcome because of the way Patchett drew the reader into the setting and the relationships. Um, close reading of page 13 might have warned the reader, but I would expect most readers would have missed that clue. Piece, page 13 is uh, probably Joanne. I, I'm guessing that's where Patchett explicitly says somehow the terrorists will be dead by the end yeah. of the book. You know, um, it, Carmen, very early on, when she when, when she's first described, and she does, you know, fall in love with the singing, and, and there's a, a page or two of a description of, of how she had never known anything so beautiful. And then it goes on and, and says, and she had never been so well fed, and yeah, she had never right. been so comfortable. And here you are in a hostage situation, and it's the best part of her life. And that's when she, and, and keeps coming back to throughout the book, doesn't want it ever to change. Why don't we just stay here forever? What I found interesting is by the end of the book, Jen came to that same idea. I mean, maybe out of desperation, but when when Mesner comes in and is clearly agitated and, and that last time when he says, you've got to convince them to give up, you know, I think there's a, a place in there where Jen says, why can't we just leave it like it is? Mm -hmm. When you think about it, though, uh, you know, that's that's absolutely impossible. I mean, right. you. I mean, how could you possibly do that? But but I'm with Joanne. I was, I was hoping, and and with Jen and with and and with uh, Carmen. I was just hoping that that we could all work it out. But that's again what I think is the power of this book because Anne Patchett is able to bring you in to that deep hope, mm -hmm. even though if you just sort of shook your head, you'd say, well, there's no way it can work out. I can't possibly work out. There's no way. Um, and then she pulls the rug out, as I think she should have. I mean, right. as, as, as awful as that was at the end, I mean, that's, that's the reality that it was brought to. But two things happened. She reflected a reality that is very likely. It has happened before. It will happen again under those circumstances. And so, you know, we congratulate her for not, you know, going off into a fantasy. But she also created another reality that is also true. There were relationships. Politics was transcended mm -hmm. uh, by through both art mm -hmm. and love, which may in some ways structurally be the same thing. In, in, in depending on how you want to view these things, you know, wave or particle. Um, but so so she also created. Well, I think you just said it. This this hope that's a real thing. Yeah. What they that those relationships, we've all known those to happen under these extraordinary, crazy circumstances. So what she's saying is, if this can happen, and if you can hold out this hope, and if you can love these people, even though we know they're doing the wrong thing, you know, could come the day when right. that really, that we reach a tipping point. Right. Um, so we should all sort of hold out hope and, and, and be in the hostage situation rather than the suicide bombing, to, mm -hmm. as if to say, there's no way these people will listen. Right, right. So, so that's a real thing, and I, I think it shouldn't be dismissed. Yeah. Um, you know, and the, the beauty of the artist, and of course this is one of my favorite sort of topics, is to talk about the power of art to transform. And I, I, I think that's probably what Ann Patchett had in mind, yeah, too, in absolutely. setting this as an opera. Um, you were changed. You know, mm -hmm. you came out of this book a different person, and now mm -hmm. you're walking around in the real world full of terrorists and lovers mm -hmm. uh, um, with different hopes and, and a sense of possibility than you did before. Right, right. Should we move on? Yeah. Question five. The epilogue. Is it surprising? Would you have predicted Roxanne and Jen would marry? Uh, you, you say you didn't. Uh, why did they? Um, but you didn't predict it. I didn't predict it. Um... Actually, as as the book was drawing on, I was predicting just a pretty grim end. Yeah, I was. I you know, could Carmen survive? Maybe you know that that would have been the happy ending that that um, we would have liked. Um, you know, would would uh, Simon get killed and it'd be even worse? You know, maybe. Um, 
except for the extent to which he was the translator for Mr. Hosokawa's right. passions, Jen really never was caught up with Roxanne or the music right. the way that virtually every other character, at least not overtly. And then he became so caught up with, um, with Carmen that... You know, I you know when I saw that Mr. Hosokawa and and Carmen were both dead, and I knew there was still another chapter, I was expecting some sort of of commentary about grieving, lessons learned. Mm -hmm. I didn't, and and I think that there might that 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 is what the epilogue is about in some ways. But but to have it be about the wedding of Jen and Roxanne, I didn't expect um, to have. Simon and Edith there mm -hmm. as the couple that was the only tangible connection to the hostage situation um, made a lot of sense to me because, as I said, I think that that was sort of a reference point of deep love mm -hmm. throughout that stayed constant. Um, and then you, you recall that, you know, it starts with a wedding just completed, um, the you know the two women, the the new bride and Edith, are wearing high heels, and so they're going to sit on a fountain while mm -hmm. Jen and Simon go and look for a place to find a glass of wine, and they go down a couple of piazzas and they find an open bar, and then Jen pauses, and that's where he comes out with this question about the fact that the press never mentioned. Mm -hmm. The, the girls, it, you know, it was 59 men and one woman. And that bothered him. And in that scene right there, I wasn't sure if yeah. Simon knew before then. I think Simon knew then, but I wasn't sure if he knew before then or if anybody knew mm -hmm. the relationship that Jen had had with Carmen. I mean, that could be completely unknown. I mean, uh, maybe Roxanne... Didn't know. Didn't know that. Although I suspect Roxanne might have, because you know there was that parallel set of trysts in the in the night yeah. between Roxanne and Mr. Hosokawa and Jen and Carmen that um, you know went in parallel. Um, so when you survive that, you know, is the only recourse to fall in love with the other survivor? I mean, is that what their love is about? And I, I mean, I think, again, the, the, the um, craft of this book is that that's a question that's left to me. I mean, I'd be really interested to know how, you know, uh, Jen and Roxanne are doing yeah, after right. a few years, right? <laughs> right. Was it, right you know, the were sequel, they just yeah. survivors who were holding right. on to each other because it was, it was such a desperate ending? Or, in fact, was it the case that Roxanne's relationship with Mr. Hosokawa was superficial because mm -hmm. it was just the music that drew him to her and it was, you know, just her dire straits that drew her to him. Right. And was the passion between Jen and Carmen just, you know, young lover's passion again in a context of dire strait, but in fact lurking underneath throughout the novel. I'm just making this up. That's I we, mean, I, <laughs> but it just occurred to me, but, yeah. but is it possible that lurking underneath throughout the novel was actually the other real true love mm -hmm. that could emerge, that yeah. we don't know if it did, because right. yeah. it's not stated, but that yeah. could emerge, which is between Jen and Roxanne? Well, I, those are all good questions, and I think they do, because of the book is uh, so well written, you're left with all of those possibilities. As I said, I was always suspicious of Hasekawa and Roxanne. I just never felt like he knew her at all or and ever got past that. So that particular relationship, I didn't trust. There was a fleeting moment when I began to think about the role of mediator and Jen as the one expressing the passion. You know, I wonder if this is his passion. I wonder if, if what's really coming through here. And if I'm, and if I'm right about Hasekawa not really being engaged mm. in the woman, in her, mm. in this person. But she feels he is. How does she feel that? Through Jen. So he's communicating yeah. his love for her, and he doesn't quite understand it. He's certainly not interested in the music. That occurred to me sort of briefly, but then all the rest of it, and Carmen, and that seemed so passionate. So I, I dismissed, it was a fleeting moment. So it wasn't a total shock when they got married. 
although it was, I mean, be just because of the horror of the ending, right. the last thing I expected was the Shakespearean comedy. And that struck me. You know, this is how we know it's a comedy in Shakespeare. It ends in a wedding. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So what's Patchett trying to tell us after all this horror? Right. She just plops a, a wedding at the end, just like they do in Shakespeare, and, you know, and they're all that's happily ever after. Another small thing that you know, I, I just couldn't figure out is, when did that wedding occur? It occurred in May. The Garua in Peru kind of is, you know, sort of a summer thing that goes into the late fall. So this hostage situation started in the fall, and it went through, and mm. it was spring, you know, because they were outside, the right. weather was nice, the, they were planting gardens and whatnot. So was it a month or two later that they got married? A year or two later mm. that they got married? I mean, again, I think that's, that's delightfully ambiguous as to whether that May wedding, May wedding was just shortly after the hostage situation or a while after. A while after. Something had developed and it took a while. Not, I don't know if that's critical, but I thought it was interesting that it was ambiguous. And um, also interesting that uh, Simon and, uh, well, they, that they maintained the relationship um, so that he was at the wedding. Clearly they right. either stayed right. in touch or, or, or felt it was important to get back in touch with him. Uh, so on this question of, uh, of the surprise ending from Joanne, <clears throat> the epilogue surprised me. And I would not have guessed that Roxanne would have married Jen. I think they married as a way to keep the memories of their loved ones alive. Mm -hmm. Jen was a translator close to Mr. Hasekawa, uh, often translated conversations between Roxanne and Mr. H. Carmen helped Mr. H sneak into Roxanne's room. Carmen, uh, Carmen was Jen's lover. Um, perhaps Jen's admiration for Mr. Hasekawa and his love for Carmen could remain alive through the marriage to Roxanne mm -hmm. and his listening to her singing opera. This is the quote, quote from the book. When I hear Roxanne sing, I'm still able to think well of the world. I don't think I would last a day without that now, says Jen yeah. on page 318. Yeah. And that gets back to your point that, that, that his sense of memory and wh what's remembered and what's forgotten is important to him. Right. That Carmen would not be part of the record right. troubles him and that the singing keeps right. the record alive. Right. <clears throat> and it's interesting with that quote that um, Jen doesn't comment on the music early on right. and everybody is taken with the music. Jen doesn't comment on that but by the end, in the epilogue, that comment that he makes makes it clear that that he is now really focused on that music as a way of of, of, of being able to move through the world. Right. Yeah, that the art itself has, has come through to him. And that he may have channeled to some extent. I mean, if they were the sort of the yin and the yang, you know, yeah. to, together. Now Hasekawa is gone. He can. He yeah. can. Um, I also think he took the role of mediator seriously. I mean, I think he began to understand the importance of it. And so, when his lover goes unmediated, unremembered through, I mean, right. through the media, that this is a dereliction of responsibility. It's also possible that he grew through that relationship. Mm -hmm. That it. it Grew, and I think you suggested this earlier that we start out kind of passionate and hot, and that's one thing. And then over time, you you come to understand what real meaning is. He may have reflected on his communication with Roxanne and said, "You know, right. I don't think I was speaking for my boss." Right. And so it's a kind yeah. of evolution too. Um, this is uh, also from Joanne on page thirteen. Readers are forewarned of the unhappy ending. It was the unspoken belief of everyone who is familiar with the organization. This is the quote. Um, that they they were all as good as dead. I missed that on the first reading, she says, but had been told there was a mention of the ending before my second book club reading. I found the passage. Uh, I, was, I, too, was disappointed. I would have preferred a happy ending. <clears throat> and then, um, I think I read, this is, yeah, that's the same one. That's good. One more from Susanna in Durham. I loved the book almost up until the shocking ending. <laughs> For me, the happy fairy tale ending without the prior reference destroyed the story. Oh, so the epilogue. The epilogue. The epilogue. The happy, the, so the, the epilogue scene is as trying to impose a happy ending yeah. on what is really not something that could have a happy right. ending. I could see that. I mean, the epilogue, it is, it is titled epilogue, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not chapter whatever. Right. It's not the last chapter. It's an epilogue. And in that sense... Like in Shakespeare, it's 
you know, a time perhaps to draw all sorts of things together. You know, there's an interesting thought that comes to mind now that you've mentioned Shakespeare is that so many of Shakespeare's comedies and tragedies, you know, transport the characters into another world, you know, the, the, the world of the forest in Midsummer mm -hmm. Night's Dream, you know, out on the moors and King Lear and so forth. And, you know, after the characters are transformed however they are, in that other world, right. they come back, and there is an epilogue that's sort of trying to draw things together. And you know, Shakespeare, of course, is very different in many ways, but some of those epilogues just do seem like they're trying to tie things together to right. get to an end and, and have a bow tied around it, necessary for um, you know a Shakespearean audience, um, I yeah. would guess, uh, and maybe our you know the modern audience. Um, you know, it sometimes doesn't work to tie the bow. It's possible. I mean, I can. I certainly understand. I think it was uh, is that Susanna uh, the the impulse to to call it that. But I have to say, I got to trust Anne Patchett as a writer so much mm. that I don't expect her to her last sentence to be the cheap. You know, sort of. I mean, they it was all a dream. You know, <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right. You, you, you yeah, sort of think yeah, yeah. She's yeah. not going to do that. So, so I guess I had this faith that because she was such a good writer, it wasn't quite that pat. Because this theme for me, the, the, the idea of true love is the courage to love in the face of death and the courage mm -hmm. to embrace the sorrow of, mm -hmm. of, of our house, I mean, where we are, yeah. the sorrow of those conditions which we don't have too much control over, yeah. um, is a way to say these are how, this is how it is brought together. This is what true love is. I mean, I don't want to simplify, oversimplify the book. Um, but yeah. but that was an important theme for me, and so well, you know, so sorrow is important. So, I mean, and and it's also true, right? You know, this is a this is well over three hundred pages, and there's only four pages of this epilogue, so it's very brief, mm -hmm. leaving a lot that's ambiguous. So here, Susanna's comment actually brings this to mind. The very last paragraph, I I was taken with as as an incredibly well-written paragraph. This is after, you know, they found the bar, they've gone through this issue of, of Simon understanding the, the relationship mm -hmm. between Jen and Carmen, and so the two men turn back to the corner and they see their wives there sitting, right? And the wives stand up, right? And they describe Edith with her dark hair and Roxanne still, but then the last two lines, or either one of them, could have been the bride. Tybalt was sure that there had never been such beautiful women, and the beautiful women came to them and held out their arms. That's actually very ambiguous as to whether there's two deeply loving couples here. Mm -hmm. Either one of them could have been the bride. You know, so is that making it, making a statement that that in fact, this is uh, somewhat of a contrived hmm. um, uh, relationship that Jen and Roxanne have come to. And if that's the case, yeah, then it's not so much yeah, of a fairy yeah. tale ending. Yeah. I mean, you know, it actually could be quite a sad ending that mm. if Jen and Roxanne have had their lives so deeply mm -hmm. uh, torn apart right. by the development of a... Now, that we're changing the tune here because earlier we were wondering whether those two relationships were more superficial. But let's say yeah. it really yeah. is deep between right. Mr. Hosokawa and right. Roxanne and between Jen and Carmen. Right. And that's gone, and they have nothing else that they can do to live their lives in a stable fashion, except to be with each other because no one else could understand the loss. And so yeah. it's not so much of a fairy tale as really making the best of, of a bad situation. And and I think makes the sorrow all, all that much yeah. more deep because you realize how agonizing the loss is. Yeah. What a pleasure, Steve Nowicki. Thank you hey, so much. My it pleasure. It was terrific and a pleasure to be with you. Thanks, Steve Nowicki, for uh, participating in Duke Reads. It's been a pleasure to be with all of you this year. Uh, for those in the audience, a reminder that this session will be available on Ustream, YouTube, and iTunes shortly. This Friday is April 23rd. Tune in to U, uh, Ustream for office hours at noon Eastern time. Duke professor Kathy Davidson is going to talk about learning in a digital age. And this summer, we're going to let you know about the Duke Reed selections for the coming year. I'm looking forward to that. I hope you are as well. Thanks very much. Good night. So...
よろしく。